For this episode, I have another brilliant interview lined up for you. I was lucky enough to get the opportunity to talk at length with James. James was part of a movement known as SGI. What does SGI stand for? What type of movement was this? And what was James's experience like? Buckle in to hear the answers. Hello, James, and thank you so much for joining us today here on the podcast. Uh, I'd like to take this second to give you the chance to introduce yourself and tell our listeners a little bit about who you are. Yes, my name is James. I'm here to talk about a cult that I was a part of for a little under six years. I live in the United States. And uh, what was the what was the name of that cult? The name of the cult was the Soka Gakkai International, um, or it's just abbreviated SGI USA. Okay, and SGI do they do they operate primarily in America? Uh, SGI is all over the world. Um, the spiel that we would usually tell people when we were recruiting was that it was located in 192 countries and territories. So SGI just encompasses everywhere outside of where the organization was originally based off of, which is Japan. So in Japan, it's just referred to as Soko Gakkai. And outside of Japan, every place that practices uh, Soko Gakkai is known as um, SGI and then the name of the country. So SGI Canada, SGI Mexico, and where I'm from, SGI USA. And when you say practice, what sorts of things are you talking about? So SGI claims to be practicing a form of what's called Nichiren Buddhism. So um, basically it's Buddhism that was started by a monk in 13th century Japan where they do this chant, uh, which is Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And what they decide to do is um, they chant it in front of a scroll, which is called a Gohonzon. Um, and this scroll is said to represent people's lives. And then on top of that, there's a lot of Buddhism that's packed on top of it. And basically the practice is practicing for yourself, which is doing the chant in front of the scroll, and then also helping, quote unquote, helping other people learn about this Buddha, uh, their Buddhism. Is it classed as traditional Buddhism or is it seen more of a, of, a, of a fringe denomination of traditional Buddhism? So when we look at the types of Buddhist schools there are, there's the Theravada, which is known as the elder teachings. And then there's also the Mahayana, which is called the higher vehicle. And then there's also what's called the Vajrayana, which I think means diamond body. Um, so every teaching in the Theravada school is what the what can be cited, arguably, was actually taught by the Buddha himself. Now, the, what the school of Buddhism that Nichiren Buddhism comes from is Mahayana Buddhism, which didn't actually start to be written down until a few centuries after the actual Buddha had died. So the legitimacy and, um, I guess, authenticity of these teachings can be argued either by the Buddha or not, uh, just because there's such a huge gap between when it, these teachings were actually written down and when the Buddha actually died. So it's it's it can be considered Buddhism because of many doctrines are Buddhist, like, you know, the, there's still the belief in karma, reincarnation, uh, but there's many uh, different aspects of um, this Buddhism that make it uh, different. For example, in in SGI, there's no monks, there's no priests, there's no reverends, and it's all lay people. So, um, and, you know, every type of person can practice this Buddhism, whereas opposed to some other Buddhisms where they just have monks and then they have the laity, so it's um, it's not your typical go to a temple, and then pray. It's a lot of um, it's a lot of uh, meeting at people's houses and then learning about what their belief systems are. And how did you find yourself involved with SGI? Um, somebody introduced it to me about six years ago. I I liked the people, and you know, every time I walked into, they call it um a community center. And they use Japanese and English terms at the same time. So they refer to the community center 
as a Kaikan, K-A-I-K-A-N. And every time I would go into the Kaikan, they would always have people, you know, smiling to say, how are you doing? And I felt just very inclu- like included, valued, and it just seems like something, you know, you know, I love to be part of, you know. So, you know, as the people continue to, you know, shower me with praise and, you know, show appreciation for me even showing up, you know, I just started to stick around. And, you know, years passed and I took on a few leadership roles as a volunteer. And, um, you know, I've, I've done many things with them. I've traveled to their conference center. I went to Japan I went to many places across the United States and learned about all these different members. So um, the more I learned about it, the more I was just focused on, you know, I want more of this good feeling that I that I've experienced when I was first um, introduced to them. You're you're describing the love bombing aspect of a of a cult with the yes, uh, and and then you said just just then that you went to all of these extra things looking for that initial feeling that you had mm-hmm. when you first joined the movement. So did that initial feeling and the love bombing eventually sort of wear off as you became more involved with the movement? Yes, definitely. Um, the more things they asked of me to do, the more I just became frustrated. And the higher I went in, you know, their levels of leadership, I just felt... Um, you know, it, it just got more frustrating. Of course, you know, there's still the love bombing, like you mentioned, but um, when I thought that I would have more influence on the things that we would be doing, like, you know, how to, like, how to hold certain activities or how to view a certain principle, you know, um, I just didn't feel like that's, um, that, you know, I wasn't getting what I thought I would be getting by moving up the ladder of leadership. Um, And there was a point where I would have to devote about four to five hours every week just to plan, discuss, and host different types of meetings. And it was just frustrating because I felt like, you know, we're doing all of this and, you know, what is the result? You know, all it was doing was just promoting promoting the agenda of SGI and it wasn't really contributing to my personal life. When you were contributing all of these extra things outside of the usual services or, or get togethers, was this from, from your choice and interest or or was it because you were encouraged to be a, a, a better follower or a more devout follower to attend extra, extra things outside of regular sessions? Oh, yes, definitely a combination of both those things. I wanted to, they would have a lot of different things that I would be interested in. Like there was an arts group, and there was a music group, and there is like, um, you know, a cleaning group. And of course, you know, I don't mind helping clean now and again. And then there's like a security group. So there's a lot of different things that, you know, I wanted to say, hey, I, I, I contributed to that part. And at the same time, one thing that they also mentioned is that engaging in activities is an expression of faith. So the more things that you did for them, the stronger your faith was in Buddhism. And, you know, in that organization, you do not want to appear to have weak faith. You know, nobody wants to be called weak and nobody wants to appear to have weak faith. So the more involvement and more time you devote, the stronger, quote unquote, person you are, um, in, t- in the eyes of SGI. And when you mentioned before um, about the, the frustration around not being given these extra responsibilities or seeing the changes, you know, or ideas that you wanted to implement being used, was it something that you were told would happen if you became more involved with, with things and, and traveled? Did you, did you assume that, that you would be given this extra responsibility? Um. Well, the thing is, there's very little democracy in terms of where direction would be given. So the way they would frame things is, hey, what do you think about doing this activity? And then they would expect you to say yes. 
And then if you said yes, it was a done deal. However, if you had objections, they would continue to, you know, try to sell this idea of what to do until you said yes. So if it was, I didn't feel like I had a choice in whether or not we were going to do certain activities or not. It was just, hey, do this. We're going to continue to tell you to do this. And if you don't, we're, um, you're not uniting with us. You're causing disunity. And that's both of those things are dangerous. And you need to conform. It was almost like saying, if you don't conform with us and with our ideas, then you're against our movement. Okay. And is this was this something that would be expressed in front of the entire group? Oh, these are something done. Okay, well that that's um that's half and half. So if it was if it just happened, they would talk to you about it privately. However, if the person ended up leaving the organization or imp- ended up impacting a lot of people negatively, they would outright talk about those people. Okay. Um in front of people in huge lectures, huge numbers. So they would say, "Hey, this person is a huge betrayer of SGI." They would say first name, last name. And they would say, this is why you shouldn't be like this person. Did you ever worry if you if you didn't agree with the movement or if you were to step away that you would become the center of these types of conversations? Oh, yes, all the time. Um, you know, if they're doing that with people as we speak right now, you know, why, like, what would make me not also enter that same position? So... They're already doing that on behind closed doors, I know, but um, it was it was a worry for me. You know, I'm the t- I was the type of person who always worried about what other people thought about me. But as I grew and as I changed, um, I just didn't. I continued to um, speak my mind and not really have too much concern about what people thought about me. And that's when I decided to, you know, draw the line and say, "Hey, I'm not doing what you guys want me to do anymore." And at the time you joined, when your friend introduced you to SGI, do you feel like you were searching for a group to become involved with, or was it something that came out of the blue? Um, it was something that I came out of the blue, but what, one thing that I will mention is that when they teach you about chanting, you know, chanting that phrase, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, right. they tell you to chant for what you want, and one of the things that I chanted for was, I guess, a better group of friends. Not that the current group of friends I was hanging out with was any bad, but I you know, just wanted to find the right group. And then it ended up being SGI at that time. Um, I wasn't too, I guess, um, like I said, my friends weren't bad at all at that time. But I was definitely looking for something greater than myself. And what does an average day and week look like for a typical SGI member in 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 America? So, um, a member could just go through the flow. But um, what I would like to detail is what actually um, a leader might have to go through. Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so a member can just you know go through the go through the motions. Um, they usually would just get um, attend like invitations to attend certain meetings and whatnot. But uh, for a leader, um, the higher in leadership you go, the sig- it's significantly more time that you'd have to devote to contributing to activities. So, for example. Um, the third, like, uh, the third week of every month, they would have what's called the district meeting. And that meeting is about an hour. But in order to get to that meeting, you have to plan, for, they, you know, they want you to plan for it. So that would take another hour. And then between the planning meeting and the district meeting, there would be a study meeting. And that's another, that's about an hour. And then between all those meetings, you're expected to also reach out to members to see how they're doing. You're expected to also propagate uh, SGI's form of Buddhism. You're expected to uh, chant and recite parts of their um, 
their literature, which is called the Lotus Sutra, um, every morning and every day. And it takes about five to 10 minutes to say those in the morning and in the evening. And um, what's also told is that the quality and quantity of your chanting is important. I know people who chant minimum one hour in the evening and one hour in the day. And I know people who chant up to three hours every day um, to the scroll. So depending on how far someone is into their faith with SGI, um, they could devote hours and hours and hours of chanting. And on top of that, do activities and reach out to people. So it sounds like most of your time is is wrapped up in your leadership responsibilities within SGI. Not a lot of time for free thinking, not a lot of time for anything outside of SGI. Were you employed at this time and juggling and juggling a job as well? Oh yes. Um the entire time I was with SGI, I worked a full time, if not more. And I did have a I did have, you know, my own interests and whatnot. And there is this one time I had I met with a leader because they wanted a certain idea of theirs to be executed so badly that they started to schedule out my personal time on in their notes and say, hey, how much time do you have for work? How much time do you have for your business? And then they, I feel they honestly expected me to devote any time that wasn't work or hobbies to SGI. So, you know, I was working full time and, you know, I have my own life, you know, I have, have family, I have my own interests that I'm devoted to. So, you know, like I said before, you know, engaging in activities for SGI was considered an expression of your faith. And the more you did for them, the more powerful and gung-ho you appeared to be. And on top of that, they would be, and they would use um, the concept of karma and cause and effect in the way that saying, oh, you're doing all these things for a movement for world peace. And because you're doing these things, you're building great fortune for yourself many years down the road. Now, you know, some people I know, you know, they have nice houses and they have nice cars, but for the case of many people that I've met who have chanted hundreds and thousands of hours and who've engaged in activities, you know, they're still at the same point in their life, whether or not they chanted or not. So it seemed as if this concept of quote unquote building fortune was their way of having people engage in more activities and just continue to propagate the agenda of SGI. Right. So if you're if you're not giving all of your time outside of work and hobbies over to SGI, you feel pressured and as though you're going to be accumulating negative karma. Um, it could be can that's one way to see it. Or you could just be they would never ever say you're doing something bad. They would just say, oh, you could be doing more and you could be building even more fortune if you did this. You could be contributing to our movement even more and you could be contributing to the happiness of people even more if you were to take this role and if you were to do these things. Okay, and did that ever creep into your hobbies and work? Would you ever go out with a group of friends and feel almost guilty like you could be doing SGI-related things instead? I think so. Um, when I first joined, I was devoting a significant amount of time to SGI. And there was a point in my life for about maybe six to nine months, maybe, I was doing an activity every single day. Wow. So that includes driving to the location, staying for an hour, hour and a half, and then driving back. And I actually liked it. You know, it's not that anyone was pressuring me to do it, but I just felt personally, hey, this is, this is, this is what you know, I'm supposed to do. And this is, um, this is, um, uh, you know, this is, this is good for me. And this is good to help other people in their lives too. And, um, one thing that really did, uh, actually affect, um, some of my relationships, uh, mentioning, uh, friends is that I would try to get some of my friends to join and some of them did join SGI. Some of them I still talk to today, but a handful of them, I do feel that it did negatively affect 
our friendship for sure. So um, when I was hanging out with people outside of um, SGI, or if I was going to an activity, I would have to weigh, oh, which one should I do more? Should I do this or should I do that? A lot of the time I spent like weighing the pros and cons, oh, should I hang out with my friends or should I do the hang out with SGI? You know, SGI made me feel good. SGI made me feel amazing. And I don't feel that at the time my friends who I hung out with could have made me feel the same way that SGI did. So naturally you'd want to combine those two things together and have them at the same time. Exactly. Yes. Okay. I, I was actually going to ask if any of your other family members um, or friends were part of, of the movement. And um, the, the friends that you did manage to recruit, have they stayed since you left? Who I are still my friends. One of them doesn't care. And then another one does not even bother with anything SGI. They still, some of them do still do the chant that I, t that we do, that chant of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. Um, yeah, but you know, it's a form of meditation and, you know, uh, 33 other schools of Buddhism do it. So um, they still do that chant and they still say, oh, when I do this chant, I feel good. And, it, and that's totally fine too. I respect that. But um, in terms of involvement with SGI, um, I don't think anybody bothers to attend any activities when somebody leaves a movement like this there are positives that you can take from these experiences that can still help you on your personal journey it just comes without the pressure of constantly being involved in all of the movements activities and 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 de devoting all of your time to this movement mm -hmm. what was the reaction of your family members when you joined this movement did they have any questions or were they or, or were they just typically uninterested some of them weren't uninterested a few just had questions like oh what is it are, are you guys like Chinese are you guys Japanese like what is this so they just wanted an understanding but when I joined I was an adult and um you know, teachers had questions to clarify exactly what it was. So they weren't opposed, but they weren't in favor. So I'd say that the general attitude was neutral. During your time spent within SGI, was there any kind of lifestyle restrictions that you found? You were kind of dissuaded from certain foods or or wearing certain clothes, um, things like smoking and alcohol. Um, we could do all those things, but of course, if we if we we can't drink at the community center, um, there's like a designated smoking area. We can't come in drunk. Um, the one thing that might be restricting is that they did not like us to explore other types of Buddhism, um, and to do so could be described as devilish. It could be described as um, slanderous, um, blasphemous. And it could just be seen as almost a negative cause to even associate yourself with a, a temple or monks or any other teaching of Buddhism. So I'd say that was that might have been the only restriction. I will mention that there is this one sect of Buddhism that they absolutely hate. And right. it's, it's called the Nichiren Shoshu Temple or NST. Now, neat, uh, a little history regarding this. Um, NST and SGI used to be part, used to be together. So NST was actually where the monks and where the priests were, and then SGI was considered where the lay people were. In in the most simplest terms, that's how I could describe the relationship. Okay. And so in 1991, NST excommunicated all of SGI and their members and then they haven't some of them went back to nst but I'll, I, what's told to us is that the majority actually went with sgi so um any interaction with anybody from the nst sect um you're actually told to report it immediately um you're encouraged that what they're teaching is wrong you're told that 
how they express their beliefs in Buddhism is incorrect, evil, and um, almost like a raping of Buddhism, even though it, the only difference that you can see on the surface is that NST has priests and then SGI does not. Right. So other than that, the practice is very, very similar. So any interaction with those type of people from that sect of Buddhism, you're actually told to tell somebody and then somebody else will quote unquote handle that member from the NST um, sect. Okay. It's, it's interesting that SGI has this opposition with another group because I've, I've recently released um, two episodes on the Arm Shinrikyo cult movement um, of Japan. Um, and they had um, a huge opposition with an SGI group specifically um, that was practicing, um, now I'm, I might pronounce this this wrong, so I do apologize, um, Daisaku Ikeda. Oh, Daisaku Ikeda. Yes, um, a very controversial figure. And um, uh, would you like me to um, elaborate on him? Yes, please do tell me more. Please do tell me more. Okay, so I think probably Daisaku Ikeda is probably the most um, uh, cult-like figure within, and I think he is probably the defining factor in what makes SGI a cult. Um, he's the third president of Soka Gakkai, and he was succeeded by two other presidents. The first president is uh, Sune Saburo Makiguchi, and the second president was Jose Toda. Now, um, Jose Toda was the second president, and he bestowed, um, I guess, the presidency upon Daisaku Ikeda. And we're supposed to view these three presidents as the three eternal mentors. There's never going to be a fourth one, but there's three eternal mentors. And so I used to refer to them as... Um, either Ikeda Sensei, and Sensei means teacher in Japanese. And so people would flock towards Daisaku Ikeda. He was very charismatic. The way he would carry himself in public was very charismatic. And um, I'm convinced today that people think that he is you know, the second coming of Shakyamuni Buddha himself, who was the original Buddha. So... Um, there's pictures of him in every singer in every single community center across. Um, and actually, if you go to these community centers of SGI, you'll always see his picture, but you'll never see a picture of the Buddha. You might see a picture of Nichiren, but you'll never see a picture of the actual Buddha. Um, you're, you're always going to see Taisaku Ikeda. You're going to see his name, Sensei. You're going to see people refer to him as their eternal mentor um and almost and some people even refer to him as you know some people refer to him as their father and their father figure in life as well so um he hasn't been seen in public other than some drive-bys and some pictures uh, in over 10 years um you know what's actually going on behind the scenes is unknown but uh, the way that people flock towards him, call him their mentor, their eternal mentor, their teacher in life, and um, the fact that also people say he is supposed to be your only mentor in life this, um, gave a lot of cult vibes when I first heard about that. I've made a note here in my talking points. Members of SGI had actually joined NST to speak to spy on members of that group? Um, I, yes, that what happened back maybe in the 70s or in the 80s. I met somebody who supposedly was a spy for SGI to go into NST. And what happened was they would go in, just gather information, intel, and just report it back. And, and then... I wasn't actually given too much detail about that other than who the spy was and what they did in or and what they I guess got back from going to the temple. But yeah, um 
SGI always wants to know what NST is doing. Um, this and one of the things that they do is um, they have this m movement called Soka Spirit. So S O K A Spirit. Um, in this movement, what they try to do is they try to actually convince people that SGI's Buddhism is the one and only correct Buddhism to to practice, and the most evil and I guess detrimental part of SJ's movement is the NST sect. So when they have these Soka Spirit meetings, it's only a handful of top leaders that that gather to discuss it. And so what they report at these meetings is, you know, who, names of the members of NST, where they were last seen, and I guess this they try to get a uh, an idea of how big their and the NST congregation is because they actually don't want the NST to build any more temples in the United States. How it is in other countries, I have no idea, but they do not want people in the NST to establish their own community centers and their own temples. And they try their very best to actually get those people in NST to join SGI. Okay. Okay. So I've, I've done a little um, a little Google today on SGI just to get a little bit of background information myself. Um, and it says that there's actually 12 plus million members of SGI worldwide. Do you think that's accurate? No. No, no. that's that's very inflated. That's on um, the Wikipedia page. So perhaps I see. Um, that's been uh, provided by a member of SGI. Um, it's been 12 million members for the past five years. I think it's, I think on paper, they may have 12 million members, but if you were to reach out to those 12 million people and ask, do you still practice SGI's form of Buddhism? I don't think they would say yes. Well, not all of them, at least. And did you ever find yourself when you were, were within SGI challenging any ideals or actions that the movement itself was, was taking? Or, or questioning why we, you were doing certain things? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, just to talk about the structure of SGI a little bit, there is what's called divisions. So there's a handful of them, but the main four I want to touch on is there's a young men's division, young women's division, men's division, and women's division. I'll be talking about the young men's and the young women's division as just youth division. And then I'll, I'll refer to the men's division and the women's division as just non-youth division. So many activities are split between youth division and non-youth division, as well as uh, just men and just women. So uh, a, the youth division is from ages 18 to 35 in the United States. And then men's division is 35 and up. So when you turn 35 as a youth division, you, you quote unquote graduate into the non-youth division. So um, one of the things that bothered me as I was continuing to learn about it is, you know, where do non-binary and trans people uh, fall into these divisions? And what's told is, oh, they just have them join whatever division they're most comfortable with. I did hear maybe a few months ago oh, we're, they're going to start making a non-binary division. And I said, hey, that's cool. But the fact of the matter is there's still activities that are only tailored specifically to the young men and the young women. For example, there's um, some performance groups. And one of them is called the Brass Band. So it's just, it's just a marching band is all it is. And then there's also another performance group called the Fife and Drum Corps, which is pretty much a marching band as well. However, you have to be a man to join the brass band and you have to be a woman to join the fife and drum corps. Right. So okay. so you can never never have the two mixed at an official SGI activity. And then on top of that there's a few quote unquote training groups which they label on things that people do as um volunteer work. So for example, 
um, one of the training groups is called Soka Group, and that entails, you know, directing cars in a parking lot, picking up trash outside, making sure it's like security and traffic control at the same time. However, if you're a woman, you're encouraged not to do that. Instead, you're encouraged to call to do something called what's up, byakuren, b y a k u r e n, which means white lotus. So, if you're a female, you're not supposed to do soko group. You're not supposed to do security. You're supposed to do byakuren, which entails uh, welcoming people into the center, picking up garbage on the inside, and then ushering people to seats and just like getting a count of everybody on the inside. So. Um, they never want a guy to do anything like a biakarin, and they never want women to do anything like what what goes on in soku. Right. I've questioned this a few times, and they're like, "Oh," and they would just avoid the question. I said, "Hey, what if somebody wants to do this?" They said, "You just um, just tell them to join the group that's neutral." I'm like, "What?" So the neutral groups would be um, some other performing groups, such as there's a dance group and there's a chorus and there's also like the arts uh, department and whatnot. So if if someone were to ask, if someone non-binary were to ask to join Soka group, or to join uh, Biakarin, but biologically they're the opposite gender that was encouraged to do that, you're just supposed to tell them to do something that didn't involve gender. I didn't think that was quite right. So this whole division stuff. Oh, and one more point I want to point out. Um, the 18 to 35 uh, group, the youth division, they have way more activities to do than the non-youth division. There's um, there's camping trips. There's, um, there's this huge festival that happened um, two years ago. Um, that only people 18 to 39 could attend. And there's only youth division are allowed to do those two training groups that I mentioned, the Soka group and the Biakaran. And so there's not too much for the nine youth division to do in SGI. So as a result, some people do get frustrated. They've claimed that SGI is ageist. They've claimed that, you know, that's not inclusive. So... I just didn't like how I felt they were discriminating both on gender and on age. Yeah, of course. I mean, the way you've just explained it there, it seems like it's 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 black and white, really, in terms of the just the sexism. Um, I mean, do you think them offering the activities to to the to the youth side of it is it? Do you think that's for retention or recruitment or what are the what are the thoughts behind those actions? Oh yes, definitely. Um, one experience that I'll mention is um, okay. So two years ago, there was a huge event called Fifty K Lions of Justice. It was held on September twenty third in nine cities across the United States. Um, this this um, this huge meeting was only for people's ages, let's say 12 to 39. When the idea of 50K, an offer to this to this event as 50K from here on out, when the idea of 50K was first presented to me, they said something along the lines of, you know, we don't, can I cuss? Can I yeah, curse curse words? You, you okay. just say, okay. say whatever you, you want to say. Yeah, this okay. is your story. Okay. So they said, you know, we we don't want a bunch of old ass motherfuckers to be in the audience. I said, what? Like, why would you say? Why would you say that? And they actually just like, just baffled me is, and said, you know, we want young people, people who are young looking, to be in the audiences when we report these events to um, Daisaku Ikeda. And I said, I mean, somebody could look young. And, you know, be in the audience, like, could you include them? And they said, you know, so we're going to have this event. Um, it's called um, Lions of Justice 50K. And, you know, we just want young people at these events. And I think, I think, just a theory that, you know, they recruit young people because 
you know, people they're still finding themselves. They're still trying to find themselves in life. And um, I feel because of the lack of life experience that some young people might have, um, they might be more susceptible to join SGI if they if they couldn't like if they haven't um, really had that experience of encountering it in an organization like SGI. So um, there's just a, so there's. For t- so 2016 was when we st- um, SGI started planning for this 50k um, event. So two years, all the emphasis. Well, they wanted to think that all the emphasis was towards 50k, but um, there was just I'll say the majority of the emphasis was to make this huge, huge meeting possible, um, and the initial intention of it was just to bring more people in okay. um d- did it work no it didn't work but you know that's that's the emphasis on youth and whatnot is just you know one of the things that kind of turned me off and you know they the emphasis on youth in sgi is almost like disturbingly um it's like grossly emphasized like if you're over 35 they almost don't want anything to do with you of course they still have things for the non-youth division but i mean they like anybody that wants to come into sgi but if you're under 35 like damn they're gonna really jump on you right okay okay and you mentioned at the beginning that you were actually um a a recruit yourself at one point what other places would SGI recruiters go to find new members to bring into the fold? Oh, anywhere. Um, everybody was expected to do what's called shakubuku. So that's S-H-A-K-A-B-U-K-U, shakubuku. Um, um, shakubuku is the term they use. They never said convert, and they very rarely ever said the word proselytize. Um, the term they use is shakubuku. Um, shakubuku in Japanese means to break and subdue. Like literally, that's what it means. Shaku, break, buku, subdue. And um, over time, they would say, oh, that's not what it means. It means to give somebody hope. It means to give somebody a path to happiness. It means to give somebody, you know, a chance at life to become their happier selves. So they would say, you know, the more you shakubuku, the more you could change your karma. So everybody, leader, member, no matter who you are, was expected to do shakubuku and to, quote unquote, expand the movement. You talk about, you know, people being recruited in, everybody's expected to recruit. Can you go and approach people who are practicing Christians, for example, and try and bring them in, even though converted was never a word that was used? Yes, everybody was susceptible to it. So they said, no matter who you are, you could be Catholic, you could be Jewish, you could be um, black, white, gay, straight, anybody. So no one was, everybody was expected to um, be quote unquote shakabuku. And so, um, and actually there's some terms for people who are like half Jewish and half Buddhist. Um, they refer to themselves as Jubus. And so, um, yeah, you could, and there was, they, they said, oh yeah, you could be Christian and be Buddhist at the same time. And this is not really just, you know, a religion, but this is a philosophy for you to become a better Catholic, better Christian, better Baptist, whatever. So everybody, no matter what religion you are, was subject to, I guess, SGI. It sounds quite similar to, um, I, I did cover, cover the Hare Krishnas in, a, in a, um, a few episodes back in terms of, um, you know, you can you can be a Catholic, you can be a Christian, you can be Jewish and also uh, become part of the Hare Krishna movement. But the people were expected to spend so much of the day chanting, so much of the day going to temple and worshipping that actually they had little time left to go to church to practice their religion 
So people would actually go more towards the meditation and the chanting and further away from their Christianity, which I found really interesting. Do you think that that's something that might happen with SGI as well? Yes. Um, initially, I was with um, a sect of Christianity. And then just some, I, and, you know, I, I still went to church when I was first um, following SGI, but it just sl- I just slowly stopped going. When you were when you were in STI, were you expected to contribute any money, or were you expected to fundraise for STI in any way? Okay, so it's a little bit weird when it comes to fundraising. So we were not allowed to do fundraisers, like no car washes, no bake sales. But the only thing we were told to do is to contribute um, either like towards the beginning of the month or during what's called special contribution, which is pretty much the entire month of May. And it's also called May contribution. What they say is that all the contributions made at that time are the funds that are going to go to help everywhere else in SGI USA um, to build new buildings, to, I guess, you know, pay for security and whatnot. So, you know, no one really peddles people to donate, but during May, it was expected to contribute something, if, even if it was a dollar or a, like 10 cents to SGI. Do you remember the, the specific moment that you decided to leave SGI altogether? The thing is, um, I just didn't... I weighed the pros and cons um, not too long ago, and I asked myself, you know, what is the benefit of just staying here? Right, okay. And, um, you know, what's the benefits if I leave? So I just weighed the pros and cons, and I said, there's more good that will come out if I leave than if I stay. And is that advice that you would give other SGI members and potentially potentially other cult members on their decision on whether to stay or go? I definitely, it, it, it's something that helped me. So, you know, it might help somebody else, but everybody has to find their own reason of why to stay and leave. But for me personally, the way I think and the way my mind works, uh, weighing the pros and cons um, was definitely the breaking point. And what has your life been like since you decided to leave SGI? It's been good. You know, I don't feel pressured to do anything. I have a lot more time on my hands. Uh, One struggle, and I see that a lot of people exiting cults go through this, is um, reestablishing the social circle. Um, Thankfully, I still had a handful of friends, both SGI and non-SGI, that I still talk to and I still connect with. But I know for a fact that the connection I had with the majority of the people had with SGI um, is non-existent and might never have existed in the first place. So it's important upon leaving um, a a sect to find a group of people that you can speak to about your experiences? I definitely think that's important. How do you think cults like SGI have fared across the world during this COVID-19 pandemic? Um, one thing that I will mention is that it gives they have significantly less control over their members because of the fact that they can't meet in person. Now, they one workaround they've had with that is having Zoom meetings like we're having right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, in terms of actually f- physically meeting people, because that was a huge part of SGI, like actually meeting up with somebody, they called it uh, home visits. Uh, That's very hard to do now. It's not impossible. It's just difficult to do. But, um, you know, a huge aspect was actually um, they had this huge movement um, called connecting beyond the screen. And now they can only connect beyond the screen. So, um, I feel like, I feel like their control over their members has been decreased, but they're going to find some sort of way to continue to establish accountability that, th- that their members are still going to practice what, what they preach, that, 
you know, their belief system has not faltered and that, you know, they still want to contribute to the movement despite the fact that, you know, a lot of things are hindered. So um, I think it definitely, I mean, who hasn't been affected by it um, at the end of the day, but um, I definitely feel like they lost a lot of control and they actually panicked. I saw that they, I felt that they panicked for a little bit. And um, when I, one interesting thing about a SGI and COVID was that they said for every one meeting you attend, you have to reach out to four people to encourage them. Encouragement could be like, oh, just checking up on them and sharing Bo some Buddhist scripture. So, um, and to this day, they still don't want people to, well, it's not, a, they, they even said in their, they have, um, they have these guidelines that they share every month on how to hold certain meetings. And they still say, Zoom meetings are still not an official direction of SGI USA. So, you know, they still want things to be old school. They still want things to be, um, they still want things to be, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you and me and, you know, nobody else. But um, I think it really challenged the control and um, political structure, if that's what, if, you know, that's appropriate to call it that. Um, that they currently have and if they don't adapt um they won't they definitely won't um they definitely won't succeed one thing that i do want to say is that you know wh whoever's listening right now um you know it's not it's not anyone's fault that you know joined a cult you know you no know, one intentionally joins cults and um the one takeaway that i got from it is that even though it was rocky at first you know exiting and leaving um it did get better it is getting better um the one thing that i'm learning right now is um i guess just we deprogramming myself from sgi because of all there's like they they have their own lingo they have their own slang they have their own terms and whatnot deprogramming myself and finding happiness without relying on some something else outside of myself um, is probably the biggest challenge, but it's not impossible. Um, I think if people are willing to go that extra step to find what really makes themselves happy and what really makes themselves um, unique without having to listen to somebody else to, um, without relying on a cult to remind them of that, I think that's definitely the first step towards you know living your better life that's really well said i think i think you've summed it up perfectly and there are so many um resources available for people that that are finding themselves coming out of these movements and um, specifically if you are coming out of sgi and uh, there is the sgi recovery room subreddit which i know has a lot of supportive ex sgi members in it and likewise, um, you can Google cult support or cult therapy, and there are so many online resources available for people coming out of these movements. I think that's probably all we've got time for today, James. But I just wanted to say a massive thank you for coming on and sharing you, your your educated wisdom on this subject matter and giving us your the details of your experiences within this movement. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for having me on, Casey. Appreciate no. the opportunity. I'm really, really looking forward to being able to share this uh, this episode with you in a couple of weeks' time. Oh, yes, definitely. I look forward to it. Thank you so much, James. Enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you again for your time. Likewise. You too, Casey. I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.